Hello, bonjour. My name is Megan, and on behalf of the Ottawa Art Gallery, I would like to welcome you to our virtual OAG Artist Talk with artist Nick Cooper. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Ottawa Art Gallery operates on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. In this video series, the 2020 graduates of the University of Ottawa's MFA program return virtually to speak about their artistic practice, their work, and what they're up to now. Following Emergent, their showcase of recent and new work at the OEG earlier this year. In this video, I am pleased to introduce Nick Cooper. Nick Cooper is a painter based in Ottawa Gatineau. Their work merges historic and contemporary images of protest and resilience to examine our current socio-political moment. Their source imagery and historic inquiry reflects their Jewish, Polish, and Croatian heritage alongside their queer and non-binary gender identity. Cooper has exhibited across Canada, participated in international artist residencies, and is a recent graduate of the Masters of Fine Arts Visual Arts Program at the University of Ottawa, where they were the recipient of numerous scholarships. Thank you so much for tuning in. And without further ado, I would like to hand the screen over to Nick. Hi, thank you so much for tuning in today. I would also like to acknowledge that the land that I'm living and working on is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. I express my gratitude for being here and welcome you to join me continuing to learn about First Nations people on Turtle Island. I'd also invite you to be active during my talk, whether that be doing dishes or sketching or um, knitting or just simply watching with full attention. So before I go to the slideshow, I just want to introduce myself and tell you a little bit about my work for some context. As a queer non-binary person who grew up within my Jewish family in Toronto on my dad's side and with fragments of my mother's Croatian side who live abroad, I've always had questions about identity, about world history, war history, place and societal structures whose lessons often manifest in forms of storytelling and geography. It wasn't until I started my master's degree in 2018 that I started to address these questions directly through painting in a way that reached back in time into history and began to build a more meaningful and understanding sense of self in the present. At the end of my BFA in 2012, I was just working on student rights in the student union and not spending a lot of time in the studio. And after I worked on social justice organizations and spent a while doing direct action activism in Israel, Palestine, I came back and almost left the art world for politics, but a visual practice kept calling me back. And I mention all this now because my current work is rooted in commemoration in celebrating uprisings and resilient communities in the visuality of marching, of people gathering, and really honoring and respecting those histories. I'm interested in the continuities of community mobilization, in the visuality of groupings of people, and questioning who took the photos that make up our archives, and how they've been categorized, for what purpose, and finally, what was happening beyond the frame. In my process, I use one to three photographs and merge them and filter all this information through painting to make a new image and create a story for myself in the present. My approach to my research is rooted in this history of activism that I have. I try to highlight resilience rather than violence, as well as examining who we are empathizing with when we look at historical images, especially images of trauma and complicate the simplistic binary of victim perpetrator. And this was in particular important when I started this project um, as I looked into Jewish history and war history in World War II. Okay, so now I'm going to make myself smaller and start the slideshow. This painting entitled Continuity that I made in 2019 was a catalyst for this whole project and deals with time, movement, and perseverance. In this painting, as well as some others I made in this moment, I engage with stories and photographs of the two week long Warsaw Ghetto Uprising during the Holocaust, where the inhabitants of the ghetto organized to fight back against the Nazi troops. Initially interacting with the traumatic images of the Warsaw Ghetto was an impulse to over-identify with the victims. 
It's because the photographs are so evocative and they really kind of stir your emotions. However, we cannot know or accurately imagine the pain of another. Art, trauma, and empathy scholar Jill Bennett makes this clear in her use of an argument for a critical self-reflexive empathy. An empathy that distinguishes the feelings of another for feeling for somebody else. In building empathy by only imagining trauma, we undermine and appropriate the suffering of others as we cannot ever, ever properly know or imagine it while discrediting embodied memory, a lived experience, since when we imagine it's intellectual exercise rather than a physical experience. Through several trauma scholars, Bennett makes it clear that an ethical, appropriate engagement with trauma imagery comes from understanding that the experiences undergone by people in the images are inaccessible to the retroactive viewer, to us in the present looking at the images, that our emotional responses must be rooted in respect for an experience that is not our own. Images like this that I referenced for the painting I just showed you have been used countless times for educational advertisements, films, novels, and so on. And it's actually a perpetrator generated image. It was photographed by Major General Jürgen Stroop and it was created in what's now called the Stroop Report that was for Nazi internal, internal circulation only. For proof and celebration of their major step toward the final extermination of the Jews. The Stroop Report's original title reads, The Jewish Quarter is No More with an exclamation point. I was unknowingly using these photographs as references throughout this project. And I find it fascinating that now I only understand the context of their production because their prevalency in the public domain it results in all 52 images populating casual searches as well as the online archives of the Yad Vashem Museum and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, which are my main research databases. These images are so far distanced from this context from their origin by artists and used all the time. And we're not really particularly aware of their history until you come across captions like this and start to dig a little further. When making these paintings, I was captivated by the faces and situations in the photos and kind of, I guess, just assumed a photojournalist was the one reciprocating the gaze of this woman in the front, Yehud at Nair. But actually it's not the case. It's a photo about deportation. It's her last, day really. And to push this further, um, photography and cultural memory scholar Marianne Hirsch has pointed out that photographs like this that are widely circulated focus our empathy on women and children, infantilizing and feminizing the victim, whereas the soldier is always male and perpetrator. So here we are in 2021 in January and, and this image shows the 50 foot wall approximately that I installed my work on as part of the emergent exhibition at the Ottawa Art Gallery. This particular group is entitled 12 Stories, named for the myriad of ways a story can be told, history can be written, and all the stories that make up an individual. Additionally, it refers to the 12 story height of the Petrovagor monument in central Croatia that I'll show you in the next slide, but it's kind of in the middle there, that stands in a curvilinear shape a brutalist architectural gem. Note the vibrant pinks and gray blues that flow between these works. They create a visual cue that despite these all being individual, they are fragments of a larger whole. So here's a central grouping that I was kind of pointing toward. And you see this architectural monument spread across three surfaces. With the simplified approach to the rendering and varying textures, scales, vibrant color and overlapping figures, it's clear that the work is not trying to represent or depict a real scene or a real time. My work does not attempt to duplicate the source imagery or an event, but instead it's a search that occurs through the act of painting, cropping and merging these photos. Multiple source imagery from different moments in different places, this grouping collapses the ge geographic and temporal or their time distance between events, peoples and spaces, and all connects to my heritage and queerness. Working primarily from overexposed and grainy black and white photos, I get to fill in the missing details and 
embellish and create new things, much like how we fill in absent memories and begin to weave a narrative or a historical connection. Here's the work further up close. And so this was finished in kind of mid 2020. And it's a painting that traces the causal relationship between the devastation of World War II, the monuments in Croatia that are built to honor the last battles of the occupation of the Nazis in the region, and an Israeli-controlled Palestinian landscape that I photographed in 2015 is kind of in the background there. And the figures in the front are um, from a photograph by Roman Vishniak, a Polish photographer, and it's of these Jewish boys in the 1930s. And these boys are unaware of effects that are about to take place and kind of this causal relationship that builds this painting. So you here on a closer look, you can see that the building or monument in the top right corner there is rendered in the same way as these boys, now absent boys, employing the ephemerality of charcoal and retriculating ink on oil, materials that don't mix materials that are impermanent and easily erased. On the left of the grouping was this painting, Sylvia Rivera. It's adapted from a series of photographs of her, the famous queer, trans, LGBTQ plus rights activist, taken by Valerie Schaff in the 1990s, shortly kind of before her death. Down at the Christopher Street Piers in New York City, where Rivera and many other queer homeless people were living at the time. There's a nod to the photographic archive through the sienna or sepia tones in a monochromatic figure. Compelled by her trailblazing story and the legacy in the queer and trans POC community, this painting emerged and led me to want to make more explicitly queer works. And there's particularly focused around um, protest and uh, which tends to happen following police raids or just kind of around pride and acknowledge this history and do more research on this side. So considering the ways in which we remember history and record it, be it through literature, film, or photography, I was thinking about monuments and vigils and memorials, and particularly vigils in the gay community. Every year, the Trans Day of Remembrance happens on November 20th, and is there to commemorate the lives that are lost from transphobia and violent acts. And this is a simple composition, just more playing with opacities to think about presence and absence. So, pushing um, contrast to really kind of show something moving forward and something receding in faith. And furthering the sentiment of presence and absence or loss, at the Emergent Exhibition, I hung this work, the blue one, with another mostly monochromatic painting that has the same um, Vishniak boys who are also used a lot to talk about loss or the past or kind of looking at a photograph in the present, something that happened in the 1930s and then knowing the ultimate fate later. So this painting, the yellow one, is using the image that's used to demonstrate how memory is always occurring in the present of something in the past and the discourse between photography and death. And photography always kind of rooted in the past and these boys, we know how they'll perish. We see them and know they are no longer present. In the blue painting, it's people that are alive now, we're calling people in the past, people who have died. And they hold vigil candles and fade into the painting's visual space. And together, these bring these two communities into one moment that do indeed overlap with many people like myself, Jewish queers, abundant in the world. And they speak to these two histories that I hold in my mind and body simultaneously. From the vigil in the queer community, to pride in the leaven or kiss in protest form, these next works were made. Pride is a time of commemoration, of coming out and celebrating, but also showing gratitude to the past people who have paved the way for us to exist in the now and live our big, beautiful lives authentically. So this work, made in spring 2021, articulates this lineage. The figure in the front, adapted from a recent photograph of Pride in Poland, where the anti-gay, far-right, conservative politics are becoming more and more pervasive. She's surrounded by figures of the past, of trailblazers as well. And on the one side, she's flanked by authority figures, by police who kind of are on the perimeter um, 
of the march. Furthermore, she's a drag queen. Drag queens and not kings are currently glamorized and popularized on television, albeit on a show that I do deeply love, but the history is long, dynamic, grassroots, and very international, and it's a central part of the gay rights movement. So here, two moments fade into each other, bisecting the canvas. In the top area, figures and protests from the 1970s New York marches move forward in time, colliding with two men who lay in the road in a steamy kiss as part of a loving protest, where public displays of, of affection are used to assert a queer presence, usually in a space where a homophobic attack has recently happened. The lovers in the front are abstracted from a photograph of the rallies or manifestations that happened in Montreal in July 1990, after police raids at the gay club called Sex Garage at the time. They're rendered in a timeless ultramarine blue in conversation with trailblazers of the past and questioning the status of transphobia and homophobia today. I use painterly strategies of the blur and the crisp to mimic the structure of memory, the oscillation between a vivid memory and a blurred remembrance that recedes in time. So from this, oh, here's a detail. From this, I made a couple smaller ones um, just to kind of explore this composition and explicitly queer visuality and protest history and look at uh, New York and Montreal and around. Oh, that one you want to show up. Okay, so my screen, there we go. <laughs> um, just before I wrap up, I want to sort of acknowledge how hard it's been to remain positive and grounded enough to make artwork in the past year and a half. And it's what I call the pandemic blues, what I keep referring to as. I know so many artists who are struggling this time, myself included. And I want to say that you're not alone and that it's really great to reach out and keep regular calls or safe visits with other artists. And it's very helpful and very magical. I found it very important to distance from social media and not get caught up in what's happening on the screen, look inward and talk with friends. I've also found it very key to find low pressure art activities. So I came up with a practice organically to take the pressure off of painting and kind of make a fun, just childlike engagement that was really satisfying and a creative act. So this is my new kind of ongoing project called A Warm Embrace, which is really about impressions about squeezing and holding and using my hands that are you know so sanitized and washed over again and not really able to kind of do their function in a way it feels like so i've been just taking clay and squeezing it and taking impressions of the spaces between my fingers or in a balled up in a fist and then holding it and smoothing you know smoothing up the cracks making a nice gentle surface and then um, kind of going with this childlike approach and no expectations and then being able to lay it out on a sandy paper after I painted it with an iridescent paint. So it's kind of like coming across shells on a beach and beach combing, but each one's already made for me. Like it has my finger mark or my crease between my fingers and it's been a really wonderful activity. So taking the pressure off of painting or like this need to be like sketching every day and just playing with clay every day instead. I also find it's really good if the creative act has this element of instant gratification where it's like, oh, I did this activity for an hour and now I have 50 of them. <laughs> um, it's been a really great method. So yeah, um, in summary, just to go back and backpedal for a minute, Inserting critical stories of resilience into the collective image bank of painting and examining images to trace a lineage to commemorate and contextualize the present moment are key aspects of my practice that shape a collective and personal history and identity. Thank you so much for tuning in again and feel free to email me and like I said, keep up those healthy art chats. So I am here and thanks again. <laughs>